title of this message is The Value of Vision. Say that. Don't sound so grumpy. Say it with some enthusiasm. The Value of Vision. Let's go to several scriptures. We'll start with 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. We'll go to Proverbs 29, verse 18. And then we'll go to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Samuel 3 and verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. But look at the grammar there. There's a colon. The value of vision. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So where the word of the Lord is precious and scarce, it creates a, a significant dent in vision. In vision. Proverbs 29 verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, that's not just the, uh, the word of God, it's the, he that keeps the law of vision. Happy is he. So when you keep the law of vision, you create an environment of happiness and so on. And then Habakkuk chapter number two, verse two, the Lord answered Habakkuk and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. And so vision, you have to write down vision. You have to write down vision. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end the vision will speak. It will not lie. Though it waits, wait for it, because it will surely come to pass. It will not tarry. Slide number three. Let's look at this vision chart. The vision chart. This is a guide to getting your dreams fulfilled. It's a guide to getting your aspirations fully realized. It's a guide uh, to walk and get the destiny that God has designed for your life. So everything begins with vision. Everything begins with vision. Here are some guidelines as to how to create a vision. A vision basically is what you want to see manifest in your life. What do you want to see manifest in your life? Write it. Write it. Number two, a vision then creates a mission. Basically, your mission is how to achieve what your vision is. And then you begin to plan the strategies for fulfilling that vision. And uh, we won't get to it, but there are seven strategies that guide you to a fulfilled vision. Seven strategies. Seven strategies. And these strategies help you to fulfill your objectives, and then you walk in an action plan. The steps that you take to fulfill that vision. Some years ago, there was a young man in our church that came and he told me that uh, the Lord spoke to him that one day he'll be the minister of agriculture uh, in the nation of Zimbabwe. And uh, of course, I didn't dispute that. And so I then asked him a simple question. You know, uh, what level of education do you have? Because if you're going to be the Minister of Agriculture, you need to have at least some level of academic achievement to fulfill that august role. And he said to me, no lie, he said to me, you know what, Bishop, when I plant spinach, chamolia, carrots, they grow so well. <laughs> That's the height of Pengaism. The fact that you keep rabbits doesn't make you a person that should be entitled to managing Zimbabwe's livestock. The fact that you can manage a bottle of water doesn't mean that you can generate electricity from Karibo or Kaborabasa. And so the thing is that if you have a vision that one day you'll be the Minister of Finance, whatever the case might be, you need to begin to equip yourself for that particular role. 
In my years, I've met so many people that have claimed that one day they'll be the president of Zimbabwe. And so my, my question to them was, how are you preparing yourself for said vision, for said role, uh, and said position? How are you preparing yourself? Uh, one of the most memorable moments in my life was some years ago, I met the great uh, Joyce Mujuru. She invited me to her house for dinner, and uh, it was a phenomenal evening of fellowship. And she said to me, you know, Bishop, I was basically 19 and 20 years old during the years of the Liberation War, and uh, she's known for bringing down a helicopter. And uh, she said when she came into, after independence, she came and was appointed the deputy minister of something. She said she could hardly put any words of English together. And she said to me, she said she spoke to us as a choice. You cannot be a, a deputy minister in government and not educate yourself. So she said she went and started at grade seven level. At grade seven level. Moved towards O level. From O level, moved towards A level. And then started her uh, undergrad work. Got her, her degree first degree in administration, leadership, and so on, and worked towards an earned doctorate. It wasn't one of those that were conferred, an earned doctorate. And so, moving in life, you have to empower yourself to fulfill a vision that God has prepared for you. Say, I must prepare myself. Slide number four. So the way you create a vision or the value of vision, you develop the big picture. So what's the big picture? For me, the big picture was in 1980, I received a book called The Fourth Dimension. And in that book, uh, Dr. Cho was explaining that what you speak out of your mouth, developed in your heart, will come to pass. And so I made this statement, which sounds a bit on the arrogant side and the maybe proud side, but I made the statement, I'm the greatest preacher in the world. I'm the greatest preacher in the world. And if I'd said that, uh, it could be misunderstood or misconstrued as an individual that was uh, unreasonably ambitious and trying to exploit people to get to a position. But when I said that, something clicked in my spirit and in my life, in my psychic, to begin to make preparation. And so then, as I still do now, I began to develop my vocabulary. I studied my Bible back to front. Uh, yesterday, we were preparing and packing boxes of our stuff for the house we're moving to. And uh, I saw my Bible that I used for 20 years. For 20 years, I saw the Bible, I was going through it, and that Bible is marked everywhere. I was doing 40 chapters a day, memorized entire books, scriptures, increased my vocabulary, uh, improved my accent, and so on. Because if you are saying you're going to be the greatest in a field, it is important that you repair and put the groundwork in. Nothing in this world comes for free. It's expensive. The higher you want to go, the more it's going to cost you. The higher you want to go to achieve, you have to be prepared for being lonely and alone. It's lonely at the top. It's lonely at the top. Life will not hand you gifts. Life and nature demands that you sow a seed, you manage the growth of that seed, and then you work to a deliberate, concerted harvest. There's nothing that comes for free. Nothing that comes for free. If you are getting stuff for free, know that somebody paid a heavy price. And so when you create the picture, know when and how to begin. Number two, design the fine details. 
That means know where you are going and how you're going to get there. Design the finer details. Just simply, uh, in, in your ordinary life, you can speak to individuals that may be a mentor, somebody that can help you with fine details. I was telling a pastor that just started a church, and uh, I said to him, what you need, because uh, the church began at the beginning of the year, and right now is almost at a thousand people. And that's impressive, but dangerous, because sometimes we can become inebriated and uh, intoxicated with so-called success because of big numbers. I said, what you need is a church strategist that can help you with the fine details of the ministry. The fact that you draw a lot of people with your gift, the fact that there's a lot of money coming in your gift. He was telling me that somebody sold $1 million into their ministry, and that's impressive, uh, but I'm not totally impressed by that because money comes and goes. There's always a purpose for money. I was giving him a guideline to design the fine details. Number three, accommodate delays and crisis. Accommodate delays and crisis. A very close friend of ours in, in our ministry was coming from Blyo on Friday, I believe it was. And uh, when they got to Guero, unanticipated, uh, a truck hit their vehicle. And thank God the accident, uh, it was a bad accident, but uh, the car was still mobile. But they had planned to be in Harare at a certain time. That unforeseen circumstance created delays. Friday night, uh, I was telling you guys about that accident. We had planned to be home by 9 o'clock, but because of this horrendous accident, we were delayed by five hours and only went to bed after two. So yesterday we were so tired and totally exhausted. As I'm standing here, I'm physically, emotionally, and mentally exhausted, totally drained because of a crisis. And so you have to accommodate delays and crisis. Can you imagine people that began 2020 that didn't uh, anticipate or foresee the COVID-19 delays, the lockdowns and all of that, the loss of life, all of those things. You have to accommodate for uh, delays and crisis. And you have to be mentally and emotionally strong. Life is not for the weak. The fittest survive. And you have to prepare for that. Number four, you have to build a mastermind team. These are collective minds that can speak into your vision. So who are the people speaking into your life and your vision? If you are the only voice in your life, you are in serious trouble. If you have exclusively family speaking to your life, you are seriously in trouble. If you only have friends speaking to your life, you are in serious trouble. You have to have a devil's advocate in your life, somebody that can deal with the actual reality and facts of life, facts and reality of the economy where you are, so that you can build walls and build freeways, build pathways, to lead you to your expected end. Number five, you have to remain resolute and focused regardless of the things you are facing in your life. You have to remain, uh, you have to be ruthless and resolute, remain focused. There are many, many interruptions, many, many. I was saying to you, Pastor Tinashe, uh, there are so many people that will pull from you especially if you become a person with substance. People are pulling from you. Family, uh, distant relatives, friends, people in your neighborhood, all pulling from you. And sometimes you can lose focus, you can lose direction, and uh, you can maybe miss the mark of what God wants in your life. So you have to remain resolute. And then know that every crisis that you experience in your life Within that crisis is the formula for success 
the formula for the next level. All crisis is designed to take you to the next level. So when a crisis comes, the next level is imminent. When the crisis comes, know that an open door is breaking. When unreasonable demonic attacks come against your life, don't concentrate on the demonic attacks. Look for where the door is opening. Look for where the door is going to lead you to the next place that God has in your life. So let's look at Jesus, all right? In Matthew chapter number 16, verse 18, he had just asked the disciples, whom do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord says to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. I say also to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so Jesus came to establish his ecclesia. The word church is ecclesia. It's a governmental order that rules. It's a governmental order that changes and sets policy. It's a governmental order that uh, not only sets policy, but creates a behavioral pattern that changes and alters a culture. And so Jesus died for his church, but never established his church. What established his church was the declaration that he made of his vision. His vision was, I will build my church, my ecclesia. And so true vision demands bold declarations. True vision demands bold declarations. And so every day, you have to declare, I'm the greatest businessman in Harare. I'm the greatest preacher in Zimbabwe. I'm the greatest father on the face of the earth. I'm the greatest uncle, I'm the greatest grandfather. I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. Muhammad Ali, when he fought Sonny Liston, he was a youngster, he was 22 years old. 22 years old and made this declaration, I am the greatest. And arguably, Muhammad Ali is the GOAT, the greatest of all time in the world of boxing. There's others like Floyd Mayweather, who is like my height and build, who's never lost a fight. Uh, but Floyd, even though he's a tremendous boxer and fighter, didn't have to contend with issues of racism on the level Muhammad Ali contended with on marginalization, dealing with civil rights in or times of very challenge, many challenges in the USA. Uh, he became a good friend of the late, great Malcolm X. He changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. He refused to patronize the war in Vietnam. His title was revoked, taken away from him, but he remained resolute. And when he came back, and in the rumble in the jungle against George Foreman, he won that fight, and definitely we would attest to the fact that he's probably the greatest that ever lived in that field. But he would constantly say that, constantly say that. He would say to the news media, he would say, I'm so pretty, you know, sting like a bee, float like a butterfly. Those are all declarations, bold declarations. Say after me, I must make bold declarations. So bold declarations are really essential in your life. These are declarations that you make in your private space and they filter into your public space. Once you make a bold declaration, Torah, once you make that bold declaration, you must stand by it. You have to stand by it. When you stand by that declaration, it then becomes like a great pastry. It's layer upon layer upon layer. I learned how to make roti by my grandmother. You know, when I see people making rutis and they give you these funny little karutis. <laughs> when we make rutis in our family, the rutis are actually like seven layers of pastry. And it takes a lot of time making them. When you spend time on a thing with layers, layers and layers, it demands private practice into public performance. Private practice into public performance. So bold declarations are important. Number two, true vision demands bold demonstration. 
bold demonstration. I refuse to live in debt. I refuse to borrow money. I stopped borrowing money in 1980. To this day, I do not borrow money. If I want something and I can't afford it, I'm not borrowing money to attain it. That's bold demonstration. Bold demonstration. Number three, true vision demands bold discipline. Bold discipline. So if you want your children to go to a great school, something has to be sacrificed. And so if you are going to be the greatest somebody in your field, you can't be watching Afrikaans movies with captions. <laughs> you can't be watching Nigerian movies all day. You can't be spending your time on television, hours and hours on WhatsApp, Instagram, and all those things. Some things have got to go. In this church sitting right here, there's a young man here. He's a neurosurgeon. The top neurosurgeon in this country, his uh, landmark surgery was removing a tumor. It took nine hours to remove that tumor, right here in Harare. He's sitting right here. If you look at him, he's like a sixth form boy, or even younger. But his first years of medicine uh, were challenging, very challenging, and then to specialize it's like 10, 12 years. And so you can't be uh, watching Liverpool beat Man United again and again and expect to attain on a high level. I mean, all the guys that are Chelsea supporters, all they ever get is a bun, a Chelsea bun. But, but if you are going to be an achiever in your field, there has to be bold discipline. You have to deny yourself. You pay now, you play later. True vision demands bold monetary investment. Nigel Chonakira, who started Kingdom Bank, him and Caroline sold their house to invest in their bank. They believed in their product and removed a major asset in their life to invest in what they believed in. You have to have bold monetary investment. If it's worth having, it's worth investing in. True vision demands bold sacrifice. Slide six. Romans chapter four verse 20 says that Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Staggering at the promise of God becomes your ailment. It becomes... Uh, it becomes your, your vice or your challenge. If God has given you a promise, don't be double-minded. James says a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. James 1 verse 7. Don't be double-minded. Don't stagger. Don't for joker under the weight and the burden of expectation in your life. Don't be double-minded. If God has promised you at the age of 75 that you'll be the father of many nations and you don't have children, be faithful in faith. Don't stagger at the promise of God. So let's look at the vision. Slide number seven. In the center of the value of vision, are levels of strategy. And so at the top of those, that circular diagram is corporate level strategy. So corporate level is not just with business. Uh, it has to do with your entire enterprise. And so what Pastor Teach and I have done, everything that we own and possess is in a trust, the Bismarck Family Trust. The Bismarck Family Trust. And so as your rising start now with your corporate strategy, you may not have property, you may not have movable, immovable assets, but a strategy is start the Tanashe Zinyemba Trust. And that trust 
will house your assets, your finances, etc. It shields you from all kinds of taxes. When you buy a property, you put that property in a trust. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're buying, for example, uh, a property, it would be more advantageous for you to purchase a company whose asset is property. Because capital gains tax are so high and so heavy, I'm not a financial expert, but I have common sense. The taxation is so high, there's tax upon tax. But if you're buying a company, as we did, the building next door 145, is Shama Holdings. We bought a company, and the sole asset of that company, Shama Holdings, is the building. Is the building. So you have to think smart, you have to think wise, you have to think vision, you have to think generations. And so corporate strategy then is, for example, that trust. On the left is the business level strategy. So what are your, what's your business ethic? If you are running at a loss, you're dying. If you're creating a profit, you're designing and growing. Anything that's sucking money out of you at this point and time in your life, if there is a, a focused turnaround in the future, then you can allow this entity to suck money and energy out of you. If you can't see a turnaround in the future where this thing yields a profit to you, you're wasting time. It's better to get out now before you lose everything in your life. And so your, excuse me, your business level strategy then becomes key. And then your functional level strategy, your functional level. How are you putting your best foot forward? How are you functioning from day to day? How are you surviving? And so there's some individuals here, you have uh, employees. It's just tough if you, if you uh, literally killing yourself to raise money to pay employees. You are sacrificing your life to pay people that may not have your interests as a top priority because they are looking at the door to find a better deal, a better buy. Find individuals in your life that are serious about your vision and your investment. Right now I'm studying the life and the strategies of Warren Buffett, how he became so significantly wealthy. For years and years, even when he became a billionaire, he was still driving an old VW Beetle. He lives in Omar. His house is so simple, very, very simple. But with Berkshire Hathaway, which has become a significant company, 83 companies, uh, his functional strategy is for the 83 companies he has, his CEOs of those companies have been empowered to make decisions. And he's like, don't phone me, just run the company. Because one of the CEOs sent him a request if the company could buy two private jets. He was like, why are you asking me? I mean, you're the CEO. If the company needs two private jets, invest and buy in those private jets. And so he doesn't micromanage because that will drive you crazy. So what are the functional steps in your vision? And so I'm not going to be involved in this church, in Sunday school, in young adults, marrieds. We have an overview of those things. But there's individuals that are empowered to make decisions and to move their respective ministries forward. Micromanaging is very dangerous if you're trying to go to a huge level of success. And so with great vision in your life, you need to identify people that can lead you to that great vision. And so slide number eight, the value of small beginnings. Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end should greatly increase. And so don't despise your day of small beginnings. 
A small beginning is important for everybody. So if you begin here, it's like Warren Buffett, uh, all of his children were not given, uh, you know, they are not included in his will to get everything that he's worked for. They've been given startup money and you work from there. Because if, if you are extremely wealthy through your, your design of hard work and discipline, if you are going to leave everything for your children, the tendency is for them just to sit and, and wait for you to die. But if you put into the, the equation of success and blessing for your children, they have to learn that I have worked to achieve this, you have to work to achieve yours. We want our children to do better. We want our children to be in better schools, uh, live in a better house, travel, holidays, all of those things. But if you keep on dishing out and handing out and so on, the children that you have produced out of your life will never appreciate the sacrifice you have made in your life. So they must appreciate the day of small beginnings. And so, with a small beginning, an honest seed must be regarded in your life. Everyone say, honest seed. For this we go to Genesis 38. In Genesis 38, the Bible talks of Judah, the fourth son of Jacob. Judah means praise. So verse 6, Judah took a wife for his son Er, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Er, son, er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and God killed him. God killed him. Judah said unto Onan, go into your brother's wife, marry her, and raise up seed for your brother. Now watch this, verse 9. Onan knew that the seed that uh, he would deposit in this woman was not his. And it came to pass that when he went into his brother's wife, he spilled his seed on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And because this man dishonored the principle of seed sown, he spilled his seed in the ground. This action displeased the Lord, and God killed him. And so if you take your seed and your future and you are refusing to invest in someone that's come before you, if you are refusing to invest that someone that has paid a price before you and you despise the cost of somebody that has come before you and you just are frivolous with it and throw it around, you are initiating a death cycle in your life. And once a death cycle has been activated in your life, it is very difficult to experience life and life more abundantly. If there is a death cycle operating and working in your life, the way you change that is by the seed that you put in the vision. Slide number nine. We're almost there. Every external is a reflection of everything internal. Everything external is a reflection of everything internal. Let me explain. I was looking out the window this morning from my floor, and uh, there were a couple of buses hitting their horn and hooter and making noise. But I noticed again the filth and the dirt in the streets. Unbelievable the levels of filth and dirt in the streets. That external shows me that there's something grossly wrong with the soul of Zimbabwe. The soul of Zimbabwe needs to be fixed. We can claim we open for business. I'm for that. But there are things that are so dysfunctional in our nation, the soul of our nation needs to be addressed. In the soul of our nation is gross corruption that has to be addressed. It cannot be ignored. It's gone from the top all the way to the fabric of policemen in so-called roadblocks, wanting a $5 breakthrough. 
the soul of our nation has got to be addressed. So everything external is a reflection of what is internal. So when I look at a person and I see the way they dressed, I'm not looking at the quality of their clothes, I'm looking at the pride by which they address themselves. So you have to look after your teeth. You may not have a toothbrush. Uh, use a branch. Use salt if you can't afford toothpaste. Comb your hair. At least you have hair. <laughs> look after what you have immediately in your life. And so I'm watching the choir members as you guys are singing. You guys are singing, I mean, you guys are hitting notes really well, but I'm looking at more than person hitting a note. I'm looking at uh, the way the members are dressed. Some may not have quality clothing for whatever reason, but there's a way in which you can present yourself with pride and honor and dignity. Dignity. You can present yourself with significant dignity. Don't be frivolous, because your external reveals the order of internal things or the disorder of your life. Your external, how you respond to pressure, if you are explosive in catatonic, explosive behavior, where simple things tick you off, it simply means that there is incomplete, uh, an incomplete soul, an incomplete person. If you are one that loses control at a given moment, you are in serious trouble. That external means there's a lot of work you have to do internally. And then point number two on that slide is, your immediate reality reveals who you really are. And so on Thursday, in Masasa Park, there are significant potholes there. And so there was a young man that to avoid the potholes came right into and, and just like this hit the car. And normally, I would be thinking, maybe uh, Lawrence and Pam are here, be controlled. And so I put the window down. It's a guy small, driving a small little car. Here's a bishop driving an S600. And I allowed that little moment to cause me to lose control. It was very bad. <laughs> I had to go and sleep on my bed, feeling very bad, watching a bed fly. And so I then had to go home and reflect on that inst I was hoping I could do a rewind to fix that. Because it dawned on me, have you seen the billboards? So our pictures are everywhere. And that moment of a lack of control, that young man could have been invited that morning to be in church, to come and listen to the great man. And then here's the great man who can't control himself in traffic. Your immediate reality reveals who you really are. And so with that meltdown in that 10 seconds, I thought, Shamari, you've got a lot of work to do. You are still a baby in certain areas. Slide number 10. 1 Samuel 3 and verse 1. The child Samuel ministered to the Lord. And so the first thing in your life is ministering to the Lord. And so I was telling the guys this morning, Mark and the team, I said the main responsibility you have as praise and worship leaders, firstly to minister to the Lord. Before you minister to the church, my gift is to minister to the Lord before I minister to you. To minister to the Lord, my family, to you. So the first thing, you minister to the Lord. Number two, the Bible says that the word of God was precious. So you have to honor the word of God. Honor it. Honor the word of God. And number three, you have to desire to manifest an open vision. You have to desire to manifest an open vision. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2. It came to pass that at the time when Eli was laid down in his place. He 
His eyes began to be dim. He could not see. And so those three things there caused the lamp of God to go out. And so when you get to a place where you are lying down in your place, that means you have become uh, complacent. You have taken yourself for granted. You have assumed that everything is going to be okay. You have stopped being aggressive. The Bible says the violent take it by force. You stopped applying force in your life to attain. The minute you become complacent, the minute you stop pushing for the next level, pushing for greatness, the minute you are laid down in your, in your place, the first thing that's going to happen is that the lamp of God is going to go out. That means that the spark in your life is shutting down. The desire to reach the next place has, is shutting down. You are regressing. You are digressing. You are not progressing. You are losing your sense of aggression. This is significant, especially if you don't understand the value of vision. And so Eli's lamp started going out. The Bible says that, that as his lamp was going out, because he was lying in his place, it means that his ability for revelation knowledge had ceased. He stopped the desire to seek God. He stopped the need to correct his sons who were avaricious and lecherous men. Uh, the abuses they had put on women and the offerings. He refused to correct his son. And the Bible says that the next level, Samuel, was laid down to sleep. So Eli went to sleep and refused to recognize the value of his vision. Samuel, who is the next level, his gift was dormant, waiting for Eli to be moved on. And so if you lie down to sleep, know that there's something dormant that's in the wings to take your place. The Bible says that Samuel was nine years old. Nine is the number of birthing. Eli was 99 years old. 99, that's nine elevens put together. If Eli had pushed to another nine years to complete 12, he could have been established forever. But the nine-year-old boy, when God called his name Samuel, Samuel, and did that three times, it activated a national vision in a nine-year-old. God gave a nine-year-old a national plan spiritually, a national plan economically, and a national plan generationally. And so for you, just remember that there are things that God has placed in your spirit and in your life that are lying dormant. Every now and then, those dormant things in your life will knock on your door. They'll remind you that there's something inside so strong that needs to be released. And that thing that's dormant in your life is going to demand a level of performance to release that thing. It's called activation through pressure. When pressure hits your life, it activates what's dormant in your life. And so, sisters and brothers, if you're looking at King David, the Bible says he was a praise and worship leader. His leader, King Saul, was being tormented by evil spirits. And so the cabinet members said to King Saul, there's a praise and worship leader just outside of Bethlehem. He is known that when he sings, his music and his skill on the harp changes the atmosphere. David's harp had 10 strings, a string for each commandment that God had given Moses on Mount Sinai. And David converted the law into a dimension of praise and worship. And so when David comes into the presence of King Saul, he begins to sing praise and worship songs. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of, sh of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So when David is looking at an evil giant, 
supported by an evil nation, David is not going to bow down because he remembers the oil that Saul, the, the oil that Samuel was pouring on his head. The Bible is explicit that David was given a vision that you will be the king of Israel. And so he was given a big picture. God pulled him from the hills of Bethlehem, put him on the battlefront to face a Goliath and gave him a few minutes of exposure, revealing to Israel that this is a man after my own heart in his spirit. He is a giant killer in his spirit. He is a nation builder in his spirit. There is messianic hope in his spirit. Is an anti-Luciferian stance in his spirit. Is a design for God's government. In his spirit is the tabernacle of David, a governmental order. And God created that moment to reveal to David that I'm raising you up. There is in the life of David the value of a great vision. That vision is going to be walked out in years of, of fa facing the wilderness. That vision is going to be worked out by running away from Saul. Saul was throwing javelins at him. Saul had put out a warrant for his arrest. Saul had put out a death sentence on David. Saul had released teams to catch David and kill him. But David understood. But David understood that there's a big picture. I'm not going to die by the hands of Saul. I'm not going to die by Nabal's facetious attack. I'm not going to die by the men I've helped who are trying to stone me in Ziklag. These men had raised up stones against a man who used a stone to kill a giant. They were just now picking up stones when David was a stone mason that could pull down giants. David was not going to reduce himself to petty emotional men. The Bible says he went away from the stone guys and began to worship. He is the rock of my salvation. He put on his ephod. Yea, though evil approaches me, I'm not going to diminish because there's a vision in my life. These men can't stone me. And even if they do, their stones won't hurt me. Sticks and stones, sticks and stones may be hurled against me, but they won't break my bones. One day in the not too distant future, I shall be the king of Judah. In the not too distant future, I shall be the king of Israel. In the not too distant future, I'll raise up the pillars of an everlasting kingdom. In my not too distant future, God will raise up my seed. The wisest man that ever lived is coming out of me. The Savior who is Christ the Lord is coming out of me. David knew the value of vision that in me is a king of kings. Yes, I'm a king, but in me is a king of kings. I'm not going to forfeit the blessing of God in my life. So for you, you must know the value of your vision. Pay the price, make the sacrifice, pay the price, raise up your standard, pay the price for your expected end. I said pay the price for your vision that has been written. It's been plain, but the vision won't tarry. It will come to pass in your life. Oh yes, where there 
is no vision the people perish I refuse to perish I refuse to die I refuse to be deterred because I see I see I see Kingdom Cathedral built I see my grandchildren married in that cathedral I see their children dedicated there I respect the value of the vision that God placed in my heart in 1980 give God a praise somebody give God a praise everybody everybody standing in this offering this is my offering as you are getting yours out we take Australian dollars these dollars right in this seed is a forest in that forest are tables and chairs so this seed is not just a forest it's finished products father we bless the seed of every person here say to the person next to you if you can value my vision if you can value my vision say back to that person I will try I will try that was nice finally the musician you showed up amen Life is tough. Life for Zimbabweans is very tough. We are trying to find solutions for our problems, looking for dynamics to alter the trajectory of our lives. And one of the ways to change that is by a simple seed. A simple seed is the attitude of generosity the attitude of giving and so this festive season as you as we gather with our families our loved ones to celebrate the festive season in a formal acknowledgement of the birth of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ however humble your meal might be or lavish your meal might be just remember that there are people in this city and not far from you that may not be able to afford anything and so approach this season with gratitude that at least there's something that God has blessed you with raise your seed